Teachers around the world generally despise Wikipedia given that Wikipedia isn't always the most reliable or reputable source. With that being said though, I think students around the world would agree that Wikipedia is a lifesaver. Whether you're trying to look up a simple equation or trying to cram for your fluid mechanics test, Wikipedia has got you covered. And the truth is, while Wikipedia may not have been the most accurate in its early days, nowadays Wikipedia is pretty darn accurate. Moreover, most Wikipedia articles are really good at citing all of their sources, whether that be textbooks or news publications, so you can easily verify all the info on Wikipedia and cite the source material. And let's not forget, Wikipedia is not only free, but they don't run any ads or sponsorships or affiliate marketing or any of that. It's basically completely run on donations, and unlike textbook publishers, Wikipedia truly isn't in it for the profit. But who even created this gem of a website, and where are they today? Taking a look back, Wikipedia was founded by two men, the first of which being Jimmy Wales. Jimmy was born on August 7, 1966 in Huntsville, Alabama. Fun fact, he was born minutes before midnight, so even though he was technically born on August 7th, his birth certificate ended up saying August 8th. That must be confusing whenever someone asks for his birthday. Anyway, Jimmy's father was a grocery store manager, and his mother along with his grandmother ran a small private school. Jimmy and his siblings would all end up attending this private school. From a very young age, Jimmy was a massive fan of reading, which is probably something that most of us can't relate with. When he was just 3 years old, his mother got him a world book encyclopedia, and as Jimmy grew up, he ended up reading the book several times. But this quickly led him to stumble upon a shortcoming. If something was wrong in the encyclopedia, how would the information be updated? Of course, newer editions could just be printed with the updated information, but encyclopedias were generally long-term investments that cost well over a thousand dollars. So people weren't gonna buy new encyclopedias on a regular basis, but they also wanted the most updated info. The most common solution for the shortfall was stickers. Publishers would send out correction stickers to encyclopedia owners, and owners could cover up the original text with the updated sticker. Over the years, Jimmy stickered up his encyclopedia, and this was his first experience in revising an encyclopedia. But he wouldn't revisit this experience for decades. After elementary school and middle school, Jimmy attended a university preparatory school called Randolph School. Apparently, the school was rather expensive for his family, but they paid the bill anyway because they highly valued education. The preparatory school allowed Jimmy to graduate a bit early at 16, and he would end up attending Auburn University where he majored in finance. After his bachelor's, Jimmy tried pursuing a PhD in finance from the University of Alabama, but he ended up with a master's in finance instead. He did give the PhD one more shot at Indiana University, but he never wrote a doctoral thesis which he claims was simply due to boredom. With all this education, it wouldn't have been surprising if Jimmy jumped straight into the world of encyclopedias. But Jimmy actually entered the world of finance. In 1994, he got a job at Chicago Options Associates which was a futures and options trading firm. Despite his career in finance, Jimmy's true interest was always within the internet. He was a massive fan of a game called the Multi-User Dungeons, and he regularly moderated various online forums. In other words, he was basically the modern day Discord moderator. While Discord mods often get a lot of slack, moderation was actually quite beneficial for Jimmy. You see, it was while moderating an online discussion group about philosophy that Jimmy would run into Wikipedia's other founder, Larry Sanger. Taking a look back once again, Larry Sanger was born on July 16, 1968 in Bellevue, Washington. His father worked as a marine biologist while his mother was a homemaker. When he was just 7, the family moved to a rather unique location which was Anchorage, Alaska. Despite the cool change of scenery, Larry's interest didn't sway much. Like Jimmy, Larry was also a massive fan of reading and especially learning about philosophy. Following his interests, Larry would end up attending the same college as Steve Jobs, Reed College where he majored in philosophy. Aside from his interest in philosophy, Larry was also super intrigued by the internet. He wasn't a gamer or an online memer though. He was primarily intrigued by the internet's potential to be used as a publishing outlet. You could reach millions if not tens of millions of people through the internet without having to spend millions yourself on publishing, licensing, and distribution. Larry decided to put this theory to the test during college by creating a discussion forum that allowed students to meet with tutors online. In other words, he basically created the modern day Chegg. So you got the Discord mod and the Chegg founder, and these two would meet in 1994 when Larry subscribed to Jimmy's mailing list called Moderated Discussion of Objectivist Philosophy or MDOP. 
The two quickly became friends and had discussions about life and philosophy here and there, but neither of them had the idea of starting a business together. So, Larry simply continued on in his educational journey stacking on degree after degree. In 1995, Larry earned a master's in philosophy from Ohio State University, and he would turn around and also get a PhD in philosophy from Ohio State in 2000. In the meantime, Larry also ran a website called Sanger and Shannon's Review of Y2K News Reports, which was dedicated to discussing the year 2000 problem. If you're not familiar with this, it was basically the fear that computers would glitch out and have a bunch of errors as soon as the date changed from 1999 to 2000. While there were some errors here and there once we hit 2000, nothing catastrophic unfolded, and the year 2000 problem ended up being a big nothing burger. Larry's site never really gained that much popularity in the first place. But even if it did, it wouldn't have mattered much given that its popularity would have fallen off a cliff once 2000 hit. Clearly, Larry wasn't having much success with the internet, but the same could not be said about Jimmy. Unlike Larry, who likely didn't have too much money to invest in internet projects, Jimmy was stacked thanks to Wall Street. Jimmy had correctly speculated on fluctuations in interest rates and foreign currencies for years which made him quite a bit of money. And seeing the insanely successful IPO of Netscape in 1995, Jimmy knew that he had to invest all this money into an internet project. Initially, he launched a search engine called Bombus, which was a guy-oriented search engine, but this never really took off. So, Jimmy decided to revisit his childhood interest in encyclopedias. The idea was to create a free-to-use online encyclopedia called a Newpedia that made money by displaying ads. For Jimmy, the accuracy of the content was extremely important. So, he wanted academic experts to review all the content before it was published on the website. And who better to hire as an academic expert than his philosophy friend with a PhD, Larry? In early 2000, Jimmy hired Larry as an editor-in-chief, and together they launched Newpedia in March of 2000. Newpedia didn't just instantly blow up though. You see, while the information on Newpedia was extremely accurate, no one wanted to contribute to the site due to their extremely rigorous approval process. Jimmy had hired a bunch of highly respected professors to review articles on the site, which was great for readers, but simply intimidated writers, which makes sense. If you're writing an article for the internet for free, I'm sure you want it to be accurate. But it's not like you want it to be graded by university professors. So, very few people from the outside contributed which meant that most of the articles came from Jimmy and his team. Jimmy didn't let this discourage him though. He felt that Newpedia had great potential so he got to work on grinding out articles. But all this changed when he started writing an article about a Nobel Prize winning economist named Robert C. Merton. As y'all know, Jimmy had a master's in finance and had years of industry experience. Yet, he himself felt intimidated to write about Robert. He says that it felt like writing a doctoral thesis, and he didn't even want to do that during college when a PhD was on the line. So why in the world would anyone ever want to do this during their free time? It was clear to Jimmy and Larry that the current model wouldn't work. So they decided to launch a more casual version of Newpedia called Wikipedia. Neither Jimmy nor Larry had very high expectations for Wikipedia. All of the professors that they worked with dismissed the idea as something that would never work. Jimmy and Larry themselves largely agreed with his viewpoint, and they were simply trying to recruit more writers through Wikipedia. But to all of their surprise, Wikipedia turned into much more than just that. Wikipedia's first edit came out on January 14, 2001, and within just a couple of days, the number of articles on Wikipedia outgrew Newpedia. Initially, Jimmy was super paranoid about how Wikipedia would affect the brand image of Newpedia. Apparently, he would wake up in the middle of the night to read through new submissions on Wikipedia and to make sure that they were acceptable quality. In the meantime, Larry was having quite a bit of fun with Wikipedia. He came up with the policies for the website which included ignore all rules, neutral point of view, no original research, and verifiability. Ironically though, Jimmy and Larry would quickly swap places. You see, while Larry was having a lot of fun with Wikipedia, he never wanted it to replace Newpedia. On the other hand, while Jimmy highly prioritized accuracy, at the core he was a businessman, and Wikipedia was clearly where the opportunity was. So as funding dried up following the dot-com crash, Jimmy pulled the plug on Newpedia in early 2002 and went all in on Wikipedia. Jimmy no longer wanted to fund a job relating to Newpedia, and Larry was unwilling to switch over to Wikipedia. So the duo would split ways in March of 2002. Over the next year, Larry tried his best to revive Newpedia by looking for buyers and even trying to buy it himself. But when Newpedia servers crashed in September of 2003, Larry knew that that was the end of Newpedia. Soon after, Jimmy tried to monetize Wikipedia by displaying ads, but this was met with a lot of backlash from the community. 
It was the community that made Wikipedia what it was. So why should one organization or person reap all the benefits? Jimmy didn't fight back much and gave in pretty easily. It seemed like Jimmy's main goal wasn't trying to make a lot of money, but to create something big and influential. And it was clear to him that Wikipedia was exactly that. In mid-2003, Jimmy launched a nonprofit organization called the Wikimedia Foundation, and this nonprofit would take over the daily operations of Wikipedia. Over the next couple of years, Wikipedia would crush milestone after milestone growing into hundreds of thousands of articles. Jimmy served as the foundation's official chairman for a few years, but in 2006, he decided that the foundation no longer needed him. He does still have a special seat on the board called the Community Founder Seat, but his role today is pretty hands-off. Since leaving Wikipedia, Jimmy has primarily spent his time on other community-oriented projects. In 2012, for instance, he was an advisor to the UK government helping to make taxpayer-funded research freely available on the internet. Similarly, in 2017, he launched an online publication called Wiki Tribune, which was dedicated to fighting biased news. And in 2019, he launched an ad-free social network called Wiki Tribune Social. In the meantime, Larry has grown more and more distant from Wikipedia. In fact, he has actually become a major critic of Wikipedia and has regularly made comments that discredit the site. He tried to launch a competitor to Wikipedia called Citizendium in 2006. It drew on the community nature of Wikipedia but also had more checks in place to ensure credibility. Unfortunately, Citizendium never took off, but Larry also never gave up. For example, between 2008 and 2010, he worked on the Watch Now Learn project, which attempted to create a repository of educational videos for kids. Similarly, in 2013, he launched a crowdsourced news portal called Infobit. And in December of 2017, he launched Everipedia, which was once again a more credible version of Wikipedia, but based on the blockchain. You just have to take one look at the all-time graph of the Everipedia token to see how that turned out. Despite all these failures, Larry still hasn't quit in trying to create an antithesis to Wikipedia. In October of 2019, for instance, he launched Encyclosphere.org. At the end of the day, the truth is that most of Larry's criticisms about the credibility of Wikipedia are true and fair. But it seems like Larry has never been able to look past that and see the bright side of Wikipedia, which is truly quite a shame. Jimmy, however, was able to see Wikipedia for exactly what it was, and I think he says it best. He estimates that Wikipedia is worth at least $3 billion today. So by donating Wikipedia to the foundation, you could say that he lost out on $3 billion. But he also strongly believes that if he didn't donate Wikipedia, it wouldn't be worth $3 billion today. So donating the site will forever be the dumbest and smartest decision of his life. Do you guys have a positive or negative opinion on Wikipedia? Comment that down below. Also, drop a like if Wikipedia carried you on an exam. And of course, consider checking out our international channels to watch our videos in other languages. And consider subscribing to see more questions logically answered. But until then, I'm Ari, and I'll see you guys on the next one.